Hello and welcome to the Quincy Access Television Studios. I'm Mark Crosby. Thank you for joining us for State View, a program that looks at uh, state issues, uh, state uh, legislation, and helps you to stay informed and uh, definitely keep you in touch with uh, what is going on throughout the state, certainly what is going on here in the city of Quincy. It all is relative. It all depends on the other. Joining me today is Representative Tacky Chan to uh, tell us all about what's been going on on Beacon Hill. So oh, that's thank a you. Lot, that's a lot to say. Yeah, well, we have, to, <laughs> we have a half hour program, so I guess we won't say everything today. <laughs> but we should mention that this is, uh, I'm welcoming you, we're welcoming you on National Voter Registration Day. Yes, it is National Voter Registration Day, and there's still time as of the shooting to register to vote for the municipal elections in November. And uh, it's much easier than ever. There's, uh, you can get, uh, check online. Facebook had a, uh, still has a link up, so everybody can get the information on where to vote, how to vote, including uh, my uh, website at the office as well as my campaign website. Very good. Good point. Uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about, um, well, a lot about uh, what's been going on recently. You are the chair of the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Ah, okay. It's a mouthful. You, you, had, you had a hearing uh, recently. Uh, talk about that. Sure. We uh, started our hearings this fall. We've been scheduling them on Mondays uh, for about uh, three hours, sometimes as much as six, depending on the docket that day. Uh, this past hearing mostly involved professional licensure changes regarding the vision professional licensure and some alcohol over quarters. Uh, most people in Quincy don't realize this because we don't have this problem, but smaller communities uh, don't have enough alcohol license to go around. They have to get approval from mostly town meetings because they're towns, as well as the Board of Selectmen to um, have the uh, legislature uh, give them an extra license outside of the existing law. So we review all those uh, bills to ensure they're properly done as well as in compliance with the Constitution. So we heard a lot of those bills. And we heard some what I call miscellaneous licensure bills regarding things like dentists and uh, rate equity and things like that. So uh, <laughs> we're moving to the random sections, I think is the way to put it. Well, talk about, I want to back up and, and just talk about the importance of the census and how that affects alcohol licenses in other communities. Oh, absolutely. The 2020 census is coming up. And the census is set for 10 years, as we all know. It's very important that everybody gets counted. It doesn't matter where you're from, where you are, what age you are. You know, when the form uh, gets there, whether it be electronic or paper form or telephone, there's a myriad of ways to do the census this year. Uh, it will set up things such as quotas for liquor licenses. So how many uh, restaurant and uh, beer and wine and package store licenses each town and city can get based on the population. Same thing regarding just to the peace. Just to the peace of licenses are tied to population. Uh, taxi licenses, which is becoming a less value because of Uber, right. but they're also still tied to the population. So in addition to talking about roads and bridges and education, health care, and planning the future for both our children and our older population, it, there is actually a direct impact on the census regarding real day items uh, that affects our economy and your and your life. And money has been put uh, forth to encourage participation in the census, quite a bit actually. Yes, the Secretary of State's office uh, received funding from the legislature of about 2.75 million. I'm hoping that's right because I said this in a previous video. And a portion of that's going to go to the Donahue Institute at UMass. Uh, to do uh, more in-depth studies as well as outreach and then the secretary is going to redistribute funds which already started to various communities on increasing outreach particularly in communities where uh, you have uh, lower socioeconomic communities that have uh, people of color people with language barriers people with disabilities and senior citizens are targets we want to get at uh, to, to register uh, the, for the census which certainly quincy being uh, culturally mixed mm -hmm. certainly is a challenge Oh, absolutely. Quincy projection for 2020 based on estimates is going to be about 40% people of color. And I always remind people we still have 2,200 units of senior citizen disabled housing uh, that are uh, public financed, you know, state and federal uh, pr uh, programs. So there's a lot of people here that we need to reach out to. And uh, as much as people think the Internet's available everywhere to everybody, well, we still have to do the old-fashioned knock on people's doors and visit you and pass out flyers and uh, watch QA TV, for example, on a regular basis, constantly repeating people that's, that's the case. And also very important, we've been telling people for many years, including myself, to not give away personal information, right? Because the scammers, they open fake IDs, bank accounts, and so forth. The census would never ask you personal information in the form of bank accounts, social security numbers, things like that. You're actually a barcode. 
on it. And the federal government has a law that makes a federal crime for any of that information being released in the public that's an individual person's information. So, and it's kept for 70 years before it becomes any kind of public record. So it's not changed, by the way. That's the same law that's always been there. So people shouldn't get this idea that, you know, you've always been insecure. It's always been secure. Right. But we are trying to remind people that it's a safe thing to do. If you're not sure, obviously call you know, Congressman's office, call my office. We can help verify if you're concerned about whether this is legitimate or not. You recently participated in a film tax panel. Mm -hmm. People, of course, will know of the film tax credit. It actually uh, is uh, beneficial in that a lot of uh, movies now are shot in and around this area. So talk about uh, what, uh, well, talk about currently how long the credit is in place and what was discussed at this panel. Sure. The film tax credit uh, will expire in 2022. And what it does, it creates a tax incentive for films to come here that invest more than $50,000 into a project. It can be TV, it can be independent film, it can be commercial, it can be a documentary, or it can be a big motion picture. And for those who've been in Boston visiting the Boston Gardens, you've been seeing a lot of production work up there, uh, shooting a movie, which I can't remember because I haven't looked at my list lately. But there have been movies shot in Quincy, quite a few. Oh, absolutely. The Finest Hours was shot down uh, at the shipyard. It's actually the equipment is still there at, the, at uh, Quirk's giant warehouse. Uh, Black Mask was actually shot here. They actually had a scene that was cut um, near the Woodward Square Girls, which is where they captured Whitey. Uh, they used that as the front for the building in Florida. Uh, here comes the boom very well known because they've contributed to our school band and hired bands all through the South Shore. And they shot at the old Quincy High School. For those who remember the old Quincy High School now, because I think your, some of these audiences don't uh, remember it, yeah, they shot at the old building before it was torn down. Uh, so you know, there is a direct impact. And, and according to uh, the film industry, uh, two-thirds of all communities in Massachusetts has seen investment made by the film industry, whether it be shooting location but even not shooting in your place, they need a hotel room, they need restaurants, they need other amenities. So even though you may not see a film being shot, it doesn't mean they've not been in your community. And we should ask, or I should ask, is the governor on board? In the past, he has not. He actually tried a very interesting maneuver where he leveraged the er, earned income tax credit against the film tax credit. So, um, I'm hoping I said that correctly. He tried to leverage um, an alternative tax credit for people with low income in exchange for the film tax credit. Okay. And that didn't go well uh, because we felt we can't pit one against the other. That's really unfair. Things should be discussed on the merits of an individual policy, not what pit one policy against another. So the legislature has repeatedly, especially the House, has repeatedly uh, pushed back against the governor uh, on that. And uh, at this time, the governor has not said indications if he's changed his mind or his feelings on it. And as you mentioned, expiring in 2022, and that's not a long time off, especially for the film and television industry. Yeah, we get your movie magic in front of you, but most people don't realize that it takes years to finance a film, and considering tax credits is one of them. So the films you're seeing in Boston now, most likely, uh, were five years out regarding their financial investment considerations as they gathered their money. Probably during the same time period, five, four, five years out, they were doing scouting, visiting different locations, looking for whether money is available, whether services are available. They don't have to go back to California, New York for it. They like to do as much here as possible. And then, but even then, 10 years out, you, didn't, you might have a discussion about a screenplay. And they started looking at possible locations then and then start the conversation about financing. And, you know, even 15 years out or 20 years out, it was just somebody's idea. Or maybe it was a book or something that was blown off the dust on the desk. You don't know. So the 2020 day is actually very important because a lot of film industry folks have already planned up to 2020, but nothing afterwards. So if we don't do an extension sometime this legislative cycle, we could be putting at risk losing work f for 2023, 4, 5, because they think there's no credit here, there's no incentive to come, and then they won't reappear again f to perhaps 2027. You know, if you look at the five-year investment cycle. So we got to look at this. And it's competitive. Georgia is one of our most competitive states. Uh, politics being politics, Georgia's it's to get some laws on, on social policy, which has had Hollywood folks rethink where they want to go. And we like to send, say people of Massachusetts is open for business. Please bring your money. 
And it, you know, it can be anywhere from you know, a few hundred thousand dollars or tens of millions of dollars pumped directly into the economy. Next, we're going to visit uh, history and talk about something called the Women's Rights History Trail, something that you favor. If I didn't, then we both have trouble. <laughs> if, I had a, if I had a wife, it would be in bigger trouble. <laughs> uh, so this is actually a great bill because it signifies what women have worked for and struggled for and brought better to all our lives over the course of history. And the bill establishes a task force to help identify and set guidelines by which historical sites would be put throughout the state, working with the Office of Tourism to set up an education program, and of course the Mass Highway Department would put appropriate signage. So the bill's in the Senate. Hopefully we pass this bill sometime relatively soon, and uh, a task force will be set up, a uh, set of criteria, and identifying sites. But it's very important as we look at our history to include everyone. Right, because history is made by everyone. And women's suffrage uh, has 100th year of anniversary this year as well. It's, it's quite good timing on that. Good point. Off-site fabrication lobby day. Talk about this. Uh, this was recently. Yes, yeah, so I filed legislation regarding the prevailing wage issue. So those who don't know the prevailing wage issue involves setting a uh, minimum wage standard for all job done on the same construction project. Right. Um, and those uh, standards are set by the U.S. Department of Labor on what the fee uh, wage structure should be. Um, the law that currently is involves all work on a physical construction site. So this law was passed maybe 30 years or so ago, give or take a few years. It's before my time. Uh, but the um, uh, things have changed. So while there's always been some level of off-site fabrication, meaning that you make a product, for example, piecing two pieces of pipe together is fabricating. You assembled it on site. Some work was done off-site, but now more work than ever has been done off-site. Off -site. As a result, since it's not on the construction site construction, it's not subject to prevailing wage law. This only addresses that issue to equalize it, to have both on-site and off-site on the same construction project be subject to the same wage law. Because it's, same, it's still the same work being done regardless of where it's being done, correct? That's absolutely correct. And because of a changing economies and how things are done, off-site fabrication makes a lot of sense because it's indoors, it's weather resistant, you do multiple projects at the same time, um, you have uh, people that are, are trained to do this, they work all year round and that's up to just construction season, and it speeds up the process of construction. So there's actually already a cost savings built in because time's truncated by having things made somewhere else, brought in site, then installed. So it also saves, saves some space depending on the type of project because since you don't have to fabricate on site as much, your space usage is also different. It disturbs the neighborhood in a, in, in a less so way compared to older sites. So the, um, there's a lot of positive things about off-site fabrication. I just want to ensure that whoever gets paid on-site or off-site on the same project are treated equally. It just seems to make sense. It seems very common sense to me. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, my colleagues on the Hill as well think so and can move this bill forward uh, this cycle. Just uh, a couple days ago, I believe, the House uh, overrode the governor's veto on Janus. Yep, I've been on here talking about Janus before. Talk uh, about that. The, we'll keep it very brief because was, I talked too much about it last time. The US Supreme, Court, US Supreme Court ruled that in public employee sector, that if an employee in an agency uh, doesn't want to join a, a collective bargaining unit to uh, unionize the agency, they don't have to. Um, because currently the way it's set up that if the majority uh, approve it, then everybody's in the same unit. Right. So that individual does not have to participate. However, the court said that you have basically a few choices left with that individual not part of the union. One is that you can um, uh, deny services, uh, but or you can provide services for free, or you don't have a union, or you can provide reasonable cost services. Let me correct myself. The first one's not correct. You can't really deny services. It's about making sure everyone's treated equally. So the third option is actually the option because you don't want to get certify the union and you don't want to give services for free for a non-union member because they're not paying dues. So we, we passed the law to allow uh, unions in Massachusetts, the public sector unions, to be able to provide a reasonable fee for services and it's predominantly associated with grievances. And of course, if you have an issue of management, you want to get an attorney or representation, you can go out to the public, uh, public find one, go to a phone book, go ask your friends to find a private attorney, or you can choose to have the union's attorney, but you just have to pay a reasonable fee. The reasonable fee would be obviously competitive against 
what the private sector would look like in terms of hiring a lawyer from outside. It's really that simple. And it guarantees that everybody has equal access uh, to proper representation against a grievance uh, at a reasonable cost. Right. The Massachusetts Asian American Commission mm -hmm. met to uh, talk about uh, that, that was recent? Yes, we, they had a retreat uh, a couple weeks back now to discuss priorities of the commission. Once a year they uh, have a getaway, so to speak, and set the priorities for the year. Um, as uh, the first uh, vice chairman of the commission and the second chair of the commission, I have quite of interesting insight about the history. So I went there to talk about its past, how well, the legislature has interacted with them, you know, different uh, projects done by past commissions, as well as the guide, providing some guidance about how they should, short, uh, how they should chart their future as well. Um, as a state agency uh, representing the seven constitutional officers from the governor uh, to the Speaker of the House, um, you know, there's a responsibility to represent their respective appointing authorities, but also uh, the entire state regarding uh, Asian Americans and bringing forward Asian American issues. Next, I want to talk about uh, gaming and uh, gambling, and s specifically uh, horse racing. Yeah, you've uh, been reading the news. It, it gets kind of buried sometimes in the business section. Uh, there's been three proposals for uh, uh, horse, new horse track being built, a thoroughbred horse track being built. Uh, one is the O'Connell's, uh, Tom O'Connell, which is a local Quincy, Quincy person uh, looking to put in Wareham. You have uh, Chip Tuttle uh, regarding the Suffolk Group. Suffolk Downs is now closed. It's been sold to a private developer. So the Suffolk Group is looking to develop one out in Great Barrington. If you have to Google map it, you will know that it's way out west against the New York border. And then the last one is called the Grassi Group. I think it's called the Grassi Group. And they're uh, located, going to be located in Raleigh, right against the New Hampshire border way up north. So the current law uh, is not reflective of the current times. That law was built when Suffolk Downs was built, so like 1920s, early 30s. And um, if there is a serious interest in the legislature to pursue uh, construction of new thoroughbred racing, we really should update the live racing law and the simulcast laws to reflect the modern era. Because we went so many years about building a new racetrack, there was no reason to change the law. And for the first time in probably 75 years, you have more than one party interested in building more than one in the state. Is that a surprise that um, times have changed a bit, uh, that uh, folks are so interested now? There seems to be, in the state, uh, gambling seems to really have taken a step up. Oh, absolutely. Uh, most people don't realize, but in the six New England states, there is no thoroughbred racetrack. The closest thoroughbred horse racing track is in New York, in, in Saratoga. And for people who know the don't know the difference, thoroughbred race tracks are the horses that run. When you see like Sea Biscuit, you know uh, the um, uh, uh, all the big races, those are the thoroughbreds. You know, harness racing is where they pull the they pull a trolley behind them with two wheels. And we have a thir we have a harness track in Plain Ridge, but it's not a thoroughbred track. And I refer to horse racing like baseball. So you have different leagues, you know, rookie ball to the majors. And horses actually have to work their way up the chain to, to get to the majors. And that, we call that a circuit. So horses will run with comparable horses of equal standing or equal enough to try to earn their way up the chain to a higher uh, stakes race, a higher prize money. Um, New England farmers don't have any racetrack in New England for them to start a circuit. So that's why this has spurred some interest in whether or not they can uh, do a successful business of horse racing in Massachusetts as opposed to having to go to New York or, or Pennsylvania or anywhere else to, to start the circuit and not have to leave the New England area. What, uh, what do you think is next? Well, we're reviewing a lot of old laws, uh, I think is the way to put it. There's been a lot of special acts starting from 1978 to about 2003. But because before 1978, there was not a lot of changes from the 20s and 30s under law. So my office and I are currently researching back in time to the various special acts. And certain acts actually expire. So there's been continuations of old laws. And we've got to figure out which ones need to be modernized and which one to end the expiration dates on. Uh, well, people think it's very simple. The legal structure is so convoluted by so many different special acts since 78. Uh, untangling it's going to be pretty tricky and we don't want to adversely affect Plain Ridge Racecourse which already exists through actually oddly through another special act 
Right. Okay, that makes sense. I don't want to inadvertently make your license disappear. Right. So we got to figure out how to uh, put the framework in that keeps the one racetrack in existence while creating a competitive structure for the other racetracks uh, if they so want to develop one. Talking about um, money uh, mm -hmm. still and, and the gambling, the lottery and online, an online system yep. and how that would impact maybe the local shop. Yeah, the, it would have an enormous impact on our local economy, especially the convenience stores, the supermarkets, the bars that sell you your lottery products. And uh, for those who don't know, on watching online lotteries, basically using your cell phone, predominantly cell phone, you can do this on a desktop computer or tablet, but predominantly cell phones to play online games. Privacy issues? Well, that's a good question. I've talked to some of the people in the industry who obviously want to bring it here, and data encryption and things like that are very important. But the lottery will get access to information for marketing purposes. So you obviously need to have a legal name, you have to prove your legal age, you actually have to have a mechanism to put money into the lottery account to play the lottery games, and it will get a lot more demographic data to determine how to change games online, and then also to uh, market to that audience. So yes, there is, you know, there's an online privacy issue there. Um, as opposed to buying a ticket, a scratch ticket at a store, you can, you know, no one knows who you are, you just kind of pay and go. And, we don't allow a uh, credit card transaction lottery. Everything's cash driven. So they really don't know who you are. So I'm thinking of addiction. You're absolutely correct. Um, because the, uh, playing on a phone will have a much more instant gratification and it's right in front of you. Now you can always argue that you can do this with racetracks. Racing does have an online app. You can argue playing you know, offshore gambling sites as well. But this is actually the state would be pursuing this as a policy. And online addiction is a serious consideration because you see people playing games on the phones, including people myself, and they just won't put it down. And the argument for the lottery is that if they want to go to the lottery, they need to uh, tap a market of new generation of folks that predominantly use the cell phone for entertainment. Well, uh, speak about that, because revenue from the lottery benefits local aid. Yep, the, uh, your uh, local aid to citizen towns are direct from the profits of the lottery. The lottery had a record year yet again, grossing $5.5 .5 billion plus. And they keep telling us that if we don't do online lottery, uh, we will lose money for cities and towns. Now, but we're doing such great business. Well, welcome to the irony. Hence, my enormous level of being skeptical about this whole issue is that if you're doing so great, wh where's your town turn projection is? And they look at the age demographic of the state. They say that, you know, after this cut of age, these these folks do not go to the store and do online lo lottery. You know, suspect, you know, they obviously don't have our personal data. They, they must be doing some rough estimates someplace to figure that out. Um, and this is kind of the challenge of figuring out this public policy piece where you have an extraordinary successful lottery. We have a state of seven million people. Our com next biggest lotteries are New York and Texas. Populations three times and, you know, nearly seven times or ten times our size generate less money than we do on our lottery. So you think about that. Interesting. It is interesting. So per capita, we're the highest per capita in the state in lottery. We have almost, I actually need to look it up, but I think we have well into five to 10,000 lottery agents, which is your stores and bars and everything else. And uh, scratch tickets, you, know, you see all the scratch tickets. Our state's very peculiar because closing in between 65 and 70 percent of all lottery sales are scratch tickets. Most states do not have that. So if you do a scratch ticket on your phone, it's basically what I call a pool tab because you can't do a random number generator. It's not a true slot machine. Each, uh, each screen comes up, has a predetermined result. You're just scratching for entertainment purposes, just like a lottery ticket. Right. So how will that impact sales of people going to actually buy the lottery tickets? And that's, you know, and that's an instant gratification issue as opposed to buying a lottery number, which you actually have to wait two or three days depending on the situation. The daily game is still very popular. People like to win several thousand dollars at a time. You know, that, that's a daily gratification. So, you know, I have a lot of questions as you can tell. So what's next? Where do we go from here? Well, I have to build my committee because I'm the chairman of this. Right. And uh, we held a hearing uh, some weeks back on this uh, and we're still engaging conversations uh, on whether or not we want to pursue this. Uh, as you can tell by my response, I'm very skeptical about this uh, type of expanded gaming as well as you pointed out as well, the impact on society because not even making it more convenient, but it's the state making it more convenient for you. It'll be a state policy pushing it forward. 
So while we want to get more money to stay in towns, you have to remember it's the city and town logo is built on the back of lottery players. And I, you know, you, we're encouraging people to gamble to provide more local aid to you. So we have to be very cautious balancing the act regarding getting money to local aid and the impact on our society. And I have not figured out the balance of which and which one uh, benefits the other more. Well, certainly as uh, this and other uh, legislation uh, becomes uh, goes further along, you are certainly welcome back to, uh, to tell us more about this and about them. Oh, absolutely. I enjoy coming here, uh, and I thank you for the opportunity, as always. And obviously, you guys pick the topics, and we'll talk about whatever you want. And I enjoy doing that. I certainly can take uh, suggestions as well. But I do uh, welcome uh, the fact or the time that you do spend and drop by Quincy Access Television because you're informing us here at the station. You're certainly informing the folks, uh, your constituents at home, and uh, I thank you for that. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you at home for watching. You have been watching a program of Quincy Access Television, your community access TV channel. Please continue to watch QA TV for more locally produced programming.